Good morning, good afternoon, good evening or good night, depending on where you are on the globe. From the World Press Photo headquarters in Amsterdam, welcome to this talk show about people power. My name is Aldit Hunkar, I'm global freestyle multimedia journalist and I'll be your moderator for this event. Now do join in with your questions and comments from my guests and also let us know where it is that you are logging in from. So today, what are we going to talk about? Well, making and publishing and seeing visual stories all depend on a series of freedoms. Freedom of expression, freedom of inquiry, and freedom of the press. And the entire process behind making visual stories depends on those freedoms. But there are many places in the world where these freedoms do not exist. Even in countries regarded as open, these freedoms are often under threat and cannot be taken for granted. Places that erupt in protest specifically are often the places where these freedoms are trampled underfoot. This is what we will be talking about today. And I will be joined by John Mincello, who is the winner in the Spot News category with his story, Minneapolis Unrest, the George Floyd Aftermath. Also joined by Zishan A. Latif, winner in the Contemporary Issues category with his story, the aftermath of the Northeast Delhi riots. And last but certainly not least, Ernesto Benavides, another winner in the spot news category with his story, Presidential Vacancy. Welcome all of you, gentlemen. How is everybody feeling this, uh, this day? Well, it's good here. Good morning. Yeah. Thank you good. so much for having us here. Well, yeah, we're very, thank you so much. We're very happy that you are here with us. First of all, of course, congratulations on being winners in your categories. Wonderful stuff. And uh, yes, thank you once again for taking the time, whatever time it is in your part of the world, to talk with us about the work that you do. So first up, let's, let's touch on my opening remarks. The freedom of press is not always a given. So let me start with John. John, to what extent do you actively seek that tension? During during protests, for instance, we're, we're just so like it's. I just woke up a few moments ago at six o'clock in the morning here in Minneapolis. So you'll have to forgive me. It was a late night actually working on um, working here in Minneapolis, which is the it's almost a continuum at this point of the Floyd work that I did last year. Um, we are a few days away from the jury getting the verdict. Um, getting the case before we get a verdict for the uh, George Floyd aftermath. Um, so as far as what pursuing tension in the photography during a protest, it, it's not so much that I'm looking for drama. I am looking for the story and there's a lot of different threads. Mm -hmm. And trying my very best not to exploit maybe not the right word, but to be cognizant of the many different ways that a story can be misrepresented and misinterpreted, especially in the age of social media. And it requires, at least on my part, a, a, a knowledge of how narratives can be bent and twisted, which is nothing new in journalism, but it seems to be so much more important now um, in the age of social media again. Yeah. Forgive me if I repeat myself. I am still just waking up. It's okay. We, we love clarity. So a, a good little. <laughs> yeah. Good morning to you. Have a cup of coffee, here, John. Uh, Zishan, I can tell that um, you, you're nodding to what John is saying. Does does it ring for you as well? Does it ring true for you as well? Um, yeah. In a lot of ways, uh, I think being a photographer, uh, not necessarily covering, but I think being a part of protests. I think for me mm -hmm. that was important to be um, more a citizen part of the protest. For me being, uh, um, I think the thin lines now, especially where I come from, um, knowing when to use the press card and when not to. So I think that's where I straddle in the, in the middle. Um, uh, taught myself uh, uh, quite early uh, when not to and when I can to use the card, a piece of paper. Because sometimes where I come from and with a name like mine, if I'm doing sensitive uh, religious based or politics related to religion, um, mm -hmm. I have to be cognizant of the fact that I do have 
also a Muslim name. So when I'm actually going in on the field, um, is it going to hamper me penetrating the, the actual stories or is it actually going to help me? I have to be a little clever when I have to actually use and when I don't have to. Um, I mean, I've, I've nearly been picked up a couple of times during the last time I was uh, uh, documenting uh, protests in Bombay um, or Delhi. Uh, the anti-NRC protests or CA protests. Um, uh-huh. um, so, um, and the aftermath of that was, uh, you know, how yeah. I made images of people trying the last, I mean, actually when I went into the premises or the houses of people, uh-huh. um, I was scared. Yeah. And I'm as imagine. human as anybody. So, yes. um, and but the, uh, being the, human is important. Yes, Sishan, does that mean that once in a while you, you, instead of, like you say, showing your press card, you prefer to be a civilian, one of the people, fly on the wall? I, yes, I think for me that becomes a more penetrative kind of uh, journalism. Um, in the scenario that I'm in, I think it helps sometimes to just um, be quiet, discreet, and just be one of the people around. Yeah. Hence, I was also very pleased and shocked that uh, images from my mobile phone won the world press. So I think uh, that is testimony that penetration can be done with any form. So I think uh, <laughs> I think that was for me uh, uh, kudos to the way we are all uh, penetrating, and it's yes. become so malleable. So uh, new, new technology is, is, is like a gift from heaven for, for people like us. And as to how does it work for you? Is, is, is the thrill of danger, does that in some way incite you to do your work? Or do you just go about it without thinking too much about it? About the thrill? Uh, well, good morning for everybody. Um, I don't, I, I wouldn't say that I am looking for that thrill, no? Like uh, Peru all of these freedoms that you were talking about before, freedoms of press or inquiring or expression, that have never been banned for a long time, since 2000 at least, no? Mm-hmm. And, and this, this protest that happened last year was a very specific case of, of how the, the country was protesting against the politics, no? Because we had this Congress and the Congress was, were, they are supposed to be our, our voice and they were not doing it. So we decided to protest. And for me, in this case, was a very specific because I've never been in such a violent situation in my life. Uh, mm. the, the press is normally not attacked by the police, no. So I I wouldn't say that there is a an attack against freedom of press directly, no. But in in this particular protest, like I was there not only as a photographer, not only as a journalist, I was also there protesting because I was part of the whole people that yes. wanted to make this change, no? But even though that the police or the government is not attacking the freedom of press, the violence that triggered in those situations, like the, the way the police was attacking all the manifest people or the press, that we were all in the middle, we were all shot by pellets or rubber bullets. So that, in a way, is a threat against uh, freedom of press, no? because you are not able to work uh, in, a, in, a, in a, I don't know, in a quiet environment. No? So exactly. in, in that sense, uh, what I was trying to do there is, is I was also there protesting. No? I was looking for, for, for the right that we had to say no. no? That was mm-hmm. for me the, the, the main thrill of that situation, seeing all these people from everywhere. No? That was amazing. Yeah. Do you think there's a there's a limit to what you can take while doing your work? I mean, this this is extra stress. The work that you that that you do, the work that I do, sometimes it is stressful in itself. But this outside stress of threat and of danger is there a limit to what you can take? Uh, well, I guess there might be a limit, but for me, in this case, all of all of those threats. Uh, turn into feelings for me, you no? Know? Feeling scared, for example. Like, what do you do if you feel scared? For my, mm-hmm. In my case, I was protecting myself, but also I can see that those feelings reflected at the end in the way I was taking pictures. And then after the whole thing, it was definitely a piece of the way on how I was editing my project, you no? Know? So 
the limits are there, but it depends on us on how you feel in, in how long or in the way you are going to face that. No, but yeah. in this case, I just uh, took advantage of, of those feelings to, to, to do my work in the best way I can. No? Yes. I wonder if anybody outside of this line of work would really understand what you're saying, but I, I'm feeling it and I'm seeing uh, your two colleagues uh, heavily nodding their heads, so they know what you mean, yes. Let, let me just take a quick look in the chat room to see where people are logging in from. I'm seeing people from The Hague in Holland, uh, Portugal, Madrid, India, uh, Switzerland. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us and, and uh, well, shoot your questions to my three guests. And at the end of the program, we will get a time to to take uh, you know to to answer some of those questions that you, as an audience, might have. Uh, gentlemen, let's now talk about how you went about your work, the work that got you nominated and that got you the award in the end. Uh, starting with John again, um, maybe it's an obvious uh, obvious question in your case, but what prompted you? What specific what specific moment in the whole George Floyd uh, situation prompted you to go out and and do what you did? Oh, well, this is not going to sound particularly impressive, but I was assigned. Uh, I'm oh. based in New York City, and um, my director of photography, knowing that I have a, a background, a fairly extensive background in covering conflict, especially conflict in the street, um, felt that I would be a logical choice because my background would also be beneficial to the team yeah. and to my colleagues which is my number one priority. Uh, I'm, I'm here to make photographs, of course, and to tell the story to the best of my ability, but also, to be honest, my priority is to make sure that we all get in, get the story correctly, and then get out safely. And did, you, I, did you at any time hesitate? Because things really got out of hand quite quickly there. Is there any, was there any moment that you thought, whoa, maybe, maybe too hairy for me? Um, the, it's always the flight in, and, and that always makes it sound kind of like you're a parachute journalist, which I really tried to do my best to dispel that, at least in my own work, and, and not to be exploitative. But uh, when you're flying in, there's the sense that you don't know what you're about to walk into, uh, especially having, you know, a, last night was a perfect example here in Brooklyn Center in Minneapolis where the previous night it was very quiet and last night turned into a went sideways very very quickly so that that sense of that that sense of what's the word that i'm looking for uncertainty can get to you a little bit but once you're there volatility you're, the volatility right and 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 an uncertainty of not knowing what you're about to see or what's about to happen to you who the players are but once you're on the street and you know who the players are you could identify who the combatants will be you know where to position yourself and that helps to mitigate those nerves it's the more information you have the better the decisions you can make and the better decisions you make the least likely you're going to get hurt or your colleagues are going to get hurt yeah. so um i would say that you always have it in the back of your mind that something very bad could happen to you but you understand that that's part of the job and you uh you have to I wouldn't, you have to compartmentalize it. There's a lot of compartmentalizing in this, especially, and this is unique to the United States, I think, well, not to the United States, but in this particular um, racial injustice story and narrative that we have here is that this is not the first of these protests. And, and it's it not the last. Last, mm -hmm. and, and there is a particular thread that runs through them that seems to be endless. And that in and of itself could be very stressful. It could really wear you out. Because it feels like you know, everyone is putting themselves in danger to report on this critical story that seems to move forward only to a point before it stops and resets and you continue to do it again. Okay, yes. Zishan, would you agree with me that as a, a, a photographer, a videographer, you develop, a, let's call it a seventh sense uh, which means you have eyes in the back of your head, you have eyes in the soles of your feet, you have eyes in your elbows, you've got eyes everywhere, looking around 24-7, uh, knowing exactly where you are at that moment. Does that work for you that way? Um, I think um, I'm already, I'm 33% I'm deaf from my left ear, but for me, I was taught very early, sound is where the photograph is. 
<laughs> so now you know you, you run towards <laughs> yes so you so you run where you hear things happening so, <laughs> but uh, a lot of people run away we actually have to go where the sound is so, 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 uh, so what what is that in in photographers that make them run toward danger that's that's, that's what i'm trying to find out um i think there is a very strange thrill to it you can't you you there has to you need to acknowledge a strange uh, selfishness to the act that yes there is a thrill to it but also a lot of responsibility and um, y your images have a lot of responsibility and the stories that you need to say are um, you have a lot of responsibility on your shoulder so uh, but i think as john said that um, you know it it uh, there are nerves there are there is volatile you need to take care of um, uh, where you are what you're doing but also i think as ernesto said uh, i completely agree um feelings are everywhere so you know when you when you're i actually became a protester more than a photographer i think for me and the images came out from that feeling of being one of them yeah. and not the other i think that's important to be one of them yes this, so, this seems, uh, this... and the energy and the energy that you feed off yeah. is of all these people this what you're telling us now seems to be a trend that we're seeing more and more that that uh, a journalist a special visual journalist become more and more the activists that they are uh, portraying is uh, and so uh, what, what would you say is, is this a good development um well <laughs> objectivity never exists no so we have to be part in in a way um Sometimes it's easier than others, no? For me, in, in my story, in this case, for the presidential vacancy, it was super easy because I was part of the whole thing, no? But mm -hmm. I believe as a as journalist, also, we have the responsibility to, to try to be able to sit there and, and, and be the ones that can see in the front line, no? So if you can take part or not, I think it depends on which situation we are free to do that if we want to, no? But mm -hmm. we also work for media, and these medias have to be as objective as they can, but it's sometimes, like, for example, in, in my case, in this story, it was impossible for me to not take a side, no? So that, for me, was really important to in the way I developed my project, no? Yeah. Okay, can you take us through the, the, the first steps of doing, of, of making this production, Ernesto? How did it go about, how did you go about it? Above the whole situation, yeah. or, or well, I was like it was a few days of protesting in those in those in that month in November, no. But my project is on the 12th and on the 14th, and I remember on the first day I was not ready at all for what was gonna come, no. But the second day I was it, it already happened something, no. But I was on the top of a building taking images from thousands of people that were in one of these squares in downtown Lima, no, and. While I was there on the top, I was already hearing that there was some protester going, trying to get to the Congress. Uh, so that was a few blocks away. So when I arrived, as soon as I was there, I, the tension was so strong. Like I could feel that something was about to explode, you no? Know? And and then it just happened, you no? Know? And and this, for example, the first image of my project, you can see the police fully protected. You can see the protesters wearing t-shirts and band-aids, I don't know, like there was a completely uneven situation, you know? Yes. But then it began, no? So in this image that you can see now, is, is the second image of the project, no? Is when like there was this idea of trying to block the shields or the of, of the or the helmets of the police wearing using paints, no? But they were using I don't know, it was it was a violent. It was a violent against violent situation, and it just triggered more violence. No, so each one of us, police and protesters and press, like everybody was just trying to to protect yourself. No, like in the way you can. Like people were wearing uh, bodyboards to protect themselves, or or handmade shields. No, but the whole situation went out of control. This image that you are seeing now, like the people were using these lasers to try to blind the police, but the police were already using so much gas and so much pellets and rubber bullets. But the whole situation was out of control. So 
that was kind of what happened on these days, no? Like mm -hmm. uh, you have to be there until you can. No, this image of the of the flag is is like it's a it's a symbol, no? Like and, and the guy for me when I turn and see this guy, I just felt kind of the same way. I was also tired. This guy was so tired, and he was asking for please just stop, you know. And and for me, when I see this guy, when I saw this guy, I just could see a reflection on how tired I was also as being there and frustrated and just wanting to be over, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, uh, it was fantastic production, uh, uh, Ernesto, really. And I wonder, maybe John can answer, the, the power of the lens. Does that work in any way for you, John? Uh, holding a camera, being, you know, uh, recognizable as somebody at work. Does the lens, does your, does your device shield you from danger? Do you feel, do you feel that way? Um, does the, does, is the, is the camera empowering, I suppose? Yeah. yeah. Um, if it's empowering from an, from an emotional, psychological, philosophical sense, it's empowering to me personally, because mm -hmm. this is the medium in which I, I present my best self in the service of other people and in the service of the communities that I work in. And, and that brings me the, 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 I wouldn't even just say pleasure because that seems so basic, but it, it that brings me a, a profound sense of pride to, to have a purpose yeah. in these spaces. And the camera gives that to me personally from a practical standpoint. No, the camera makes me a target. Um, <laughs> which is the camera identifies me as being not of the space, but in the space. And therefore I am just, I, I am a different thing to everybody who sees me, whether it's the authorities or right. a pro and let's also be, you know, clear here that authorities and protesters are not monoliths. Those mm -hmm. two groups are not just two groups. There's different authorities with different agendas and different pro groups of protesters with different agendas. And there's some people who exist in a kind of a void space that they're not there for any particular reason other than to do violence. So right. the, camera, the camera is in its way a duality. You know, for me and for those people who value visual journalism as a the most direct form of storytelling to mm -hmm. someone's mind, to their spirit, it's, it's very much appreciated and beloved. I mean, I, I personally feel that photojournalism has been the, um, the greatest uh, teacher in my life. However, <laughs> in a practical sense, it's also made, it's also makes the photographer, the journalist very vulnerable. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it's a powerful medium, no matter what way you ca cut it. It's Definitely. very to have a camera in your hands. Yes, and Zishan was commenting on the fact that his, uh, his winning photo was made with his phone. Does new technology help in any in any way as you as you as you work as you make your your work, Zishan? I think, I think penetrative. I think how it's become so uh, part of our culture, the mm -hmm. mobile phone. So as John said, um, yes, the camera can be. Of course, uh, empowering tool, but also we are, we are the targets. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think um, I actually this became personal for me when I because I had never ever witnessed um, scenes like this before. So this is the first time I was actually witnessing firsthand uh, a week later from, from uh, um, uh, religious uh, 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 sectarian kind of uh, violence and uh, riots that happen in the northeast uh, uh, parts of Delhi yeah. and uh, worst riots in the longest time. Um, I was born in this city, um, raised in a suburb of the city, but went to went to uh, college in Bombay. But I mean, you do feel part of where you were born and it just um, and to happen. I come from a privileged um, half Muslim, half Parsi family. Um, I do have privilege, but I also to use privilege as a medium of telling the story. Yes. Um, so I know, I know that I'm educated so I can actually answer back. 
I can give answers to authority, but when it comes to people from these quarters where maybe they cannot answer and they were they were forced to flee in in 15 minutes or 10 minutes, they had to leave um, their own homes. So mm-hmm. for me, it became personal in terms of um, religious identity, identity politics, all of that, because mm-hmm. I was I had never been made to feel inferior or superior mm-hmm. in my society. You were the norm in your, in your own. Mm-hmm. So I have never been made to feel that. So this became personal for me to try and penetrate areas where uh, violence is um, happening on the na- at because on the behest of religion and mm-hmm. uh, uh, because of uh, right wing, left wing. Uh, uh, contradictory in terms of uh, their politics and identity politics. And so uh, for me to be in the middle of that, the mobile phone became um, a way of penetrating as a citizen. Yes. As someone feeling it, this could have been us. Exactly. So, uh, what's, um, what's the picture we're seeing now, Zishan? Tell us what, what we're seeing now. You know, I was, um, you know, I was, I went to uh, the Shiv Vihar area of the Northeast uh, Delhi uh, riots where things were really heating up. Uh, it started on the 24th, 25th of February in 2020. Um, this is one of the Muslim areas of the Shiv Vihar, Muslim and Hindu area. This is on the Muslim side. Um, this was, you know, from outside you would see this really anti-ish but fairly recently painted happy house yellow house and then you see these flames taking over mm-hmm. and then you go inside and you see um, this is a different house but the previous image of uh, shards of uh, light was in a gymnasium on the second floor of a, yes. of a building i think uh, owned by a muslim family so there was that, a butcher shop mm-hmm. that's a skipping rope in a gymnasium. A, oh, I thought it was. I thought it was a cable that was abandoned. A skipping rope. It's. I mean. That's even um, worse. So yes, life. It's so life. Pieces it's a, of yeah. I mean, the everyday having to be forced to flee for your life. Right. So I think yes. uh, for me, everyday things and the shards became symbolic of what uh, a particular community is being forced to actually uh, relook their identity in a plural society like India. Mm-hmm. This is this is You've abandoned asked, life, so to speak. Yeah. Like yes. Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, majority sections of that area, yes. And uh, I would like to put now faces to all these properties, right? Yeah. So now I want to go back to try and put faces and people, humans, to these. Um, particular houses. So that would be my endeavor to go back and find people. How will um, you find or them? At least I, I don't know. I don't yeah. know. I think yeah. I, the way I went with two other photographer friends of mine, Mustafa and Ishan, to these locations mm-hmm. um, on the 3rd of March 2020, I'd like to hope, hoping that friends and photographers can go back as support and find these people uh, whose houses these were. Right. And try and put human faces to this. So that will be your next submission to World Press. I would like to. Find them. I would yes. like to think that I could do that. <laughs> I, I think you should try, really. Yes, uh, Ernesto. Um, what would you say is the most important thing that working under these kind of circumstances has taught you about yourself, about life, about structures? Well, as a photographer, I have being able to to see different realities, you know, like that is something for me that is one of the most important thing of my work, you know, being able to just touch other people or let other people touch you in different ways or or experience violent situations, happy situations, environmental, social, like being around, you know, like I think uh, as a photographer, being able to be around my country which is mainly what I do, no? Like I, I've been outside for other assignments, but I basically work here in Peru, no? And because there is a lot of stories to do here also, and it's very inspiring to do it because through that also we can be 
tools to make a change. No, uh, we can denounce a subject, a situation, and as 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 a photographer, as a journalist, as a creator, we can be there and leave part of far part of us. No, in the way we interpret this situation and try to make a change, not only to be there and to be touched or to touch, but also to be able to to create a change, to make things better or worse, it depends on which, where you are, no? But I think yes. those are one of the most important things for me. So, so, so what does this, all this realization that you are now describing, what does it tell you about you as a person? About me, wow. Mm -hmm. uh, I like to <laughs> that's a hard question. Myself. Yeah, you are. Um, are maybe you, that I am not. For example, mm -hmm, go. No, tell me. No, I'm thinking that, that you realize that you are uh, more activist, that you realize you're more brave, that you realize you're more scared than you thought before, things like that. Uh, yeah, I realize that I am not happy about many things. And I, and I can make something for that, definitely. Yes. No, like, for example, one of the last things that I am still doing is about the Amazon rainforest and the illegal gold mining there. So I am not happy for that. And I am... I have the chance to do something for that. So that makes me really happy to be, to acknowledge that I can do it, you know, and that fulfills me into continue doing it, you know, because we can make a change. And that's something really nice to feel, for example. I agree. I, and and I, I can totally imagine how that makes you feel, yes. Uh, John, how does that work for you? Have a cup of coffee, uh, John. Um, <laughs> did, did, did doing your work teach you anything about you as a person? <clears throat> Um, it provides me the means of, of constant self-reflection and evaluation. Um, this, the, the story that, that I submitted and also the stories that I work on quite often in the United States are reflectant of a circumstance that is ongoing. And I, I would say, how has it changed me or how does it affect me personally? There's a there's a certain tragic feudalism to in, that's ro, that's beautifully romantic in a way, but also very tragically sad. Where you you throw yourself into something because you know it's meaningful, because you know that it's important, and you know that you're going to leave a part of yourself there every time you go out there. Um, and that you have to be present and you have to be willing to sacrifice in order to um, in order to report a story fairly. And in that way, um, it, it can hurt sometimes. Sometimes you can you can read from one of these stories and you could feel a profound sense of, uh, um, I would say, um, what's the you could feel profoundly um, pained just yes. just. You can feel quite a lot of pain. You carry that with you. And you see some things sometimes that they, they, they stay in your mind. Sometimes you, you lay in bed at night, you see them. And the thing and, is, you can't really talk to anybody about those things because they don't know what it is you're going through. So how do you deal with that when you lie in your bed feeling the pain? Well, um, well that might not necessarily apply to me because I have a big mouth. Uh, it runs <laughs> in my face. So uh, I'll try to explain it, and and they'll they'll try to tell me that they don't want to hear it, but I'm gonna still try anyway. So you know, but that's their problem, right? Um, <laughs> but it, but in in all seriousness, um, you know, it's it's wonderful that you're able that it's wonderful that it brings at least for me, speaking for me, a sense uh, an opportunity to truly reflect upon why you do a thing. Um, there are those folks that think that we're just fire runners, that we're just chasing the adrenaline rush or ch chasing the violence because it gives you a sense of pride and power. It makes you feel like, yeah, I'm the man or something like that. Huh. Um, but it really gives you, it, it forces you to take a step back and recognize why you do what you do and recommit yourself to the process of storytelling and that yeah. this one of the human stories that is perpetual it is painful it is sometimes futile because it doesn't result in the progress that you're hoping it will mm -hmm. but that's what human history is is that slow 
plodding, sometimes hesitant march into the future. And you are a very small, minuscule part of that, but your minuscule part of that is still very important because if it wasn't for those little inches or centimeters that you move the story forward, there would be no progress at all. So. Wow. If, if, if I was a room full of people, I'd be loudly applauding you right now. Wonderfully said, very, very poetic the way you say that. And time is running fast. And I have one more question. I, I'm going to let Sushan answer it. Um, how does it make you feel when your work is, you know, you've been working on it for, for weeks, months, editing, lighting, all of that. And then suddenly it's out there in the open for the world to see, influencing thought and opinions worldwide. How does that make you feel, Sushan? Once your work is out, it's never yours. Ah, but it's still um, yours because think, uh, you will, you will you mean, recognize yes. it in a heartbeat. Yes, I mean, it's, um, <laughs> yes, there's just a lot of sentiment um, attached to what we do. As uh, my dear colleagues over here have mentioned already, I think it's uh, personal and it's also uh, subjective. Uh, how do you take um, emotions out of it from the situation, from the story? Um, it was very personal for me. Um, I chose to speak about them in a in a way if it was my home, um, and I did that in my own way. Uh, we all look at life differently, and um, we all look at life differently. And uh, um, I'm just really glad that the foundation, the World Press Photo Foundation and the jury saw merit in our work to give it a home. Yeah. And uh, millions of people get to see these stories that would have been uh, swept under the, under the carpet of, you know, you know, um, the pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, pandemic is so important, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. Raging revolutions have been thwarted because of the pandemic. And um, the NRC was one of them. And, uh, you know, so th this was one of the last riots that happened just before the pandemic uh, ensued the world. So I think uh, this is to recognize that the, all these stories are important. Yeah. And yeah. any form and medium to tell mm -hmm. them are all important. And just thank you to everybody. Thank you for, thank you. No, and thank you for, for doing what you do. And, and, and to be honest, um, you guys are not only visual poets, you are poets in word and deed as well. We, we have a, a couple of minutes left for some questions uh, in the chat room. So let me just read them as they come in. Uh, a question to all from Remco. How do you handle aggressive protesters towards uh, photographers and media, for example, Saying you are creating fake news, etc. Um, Ernesto, I'm going to give that one to you. Do you do you encounter that a lot? Other protesters. To handle attacking protesters. You? Mm. Yeah, well, I think uh, through the years of being a, a photojournalist, you learn to to talk with people sometimes and to read uh, how, when to leave your camera or when not. You no, know? uh, for example, in my story, at some point I was in the middle and. You are not supposed to be in the middle taking pictures because you are in a very, in, you are in the spot, in a danger spot, no? And then the people was really close. I was taking some images of the police and then I turn and I begin to take images of the people and the people just say, they almost took my camera out and say, no man, like no faces, no people, no? And I just put it down. And then again, after a little bit, I did it again. And, and then, you know what changed when they realized that I was also there for them and mm -hmm. I was also being there, being injured with them and suffering the whole consequences with them. They just allowed me to be there for, with them. No? So I yeah. think through experience, you can, you can learn to, to read different situations and to be able to know when you can do it. No? So yeah. in, in my case, I just try to be close to the people or far away. It depends on the situation. No? But in this case, when they realized that I was part of the whole situation, they let me in. So that yeah. was really amazing because they took care of me also. You know? Exactly. This is probably what I meant when I said earlier, the seventh sense that you, that you in, in your work develop. It's how to read the people, how to read the situation. Let me take another uh, question here from Angel Garcia. 
the point of being participant in the protest is really interesting. Do you think that professionals should take some responsibility regarding the later use of their images? Dushan, what do you say to that? Uh, with the advent of technology, I think um, um, John has already stressed on the point that we have responsibility and how it's going to be disseminated, the the images and how, how they're going to be disseminated through social media or uh, through many platforms that are available today. Um, I My images were never published. These mm -hmm. images were made on the mobile phone. I went back. Even my narrative, my words with these images were not uh, profound or anything. I just said, I just said, I know, I'm, I, I just said, I think I'm educated. I know r right from wrong. That's all I said. Mm -hmm. So because this whole thing from the beginning was personal for me. And then, and then things started spreading on social media. These images started spreading and people started uh, uh, resonating with the way I took the images, the way I saw the, 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 the premises and people's houses and things mm -hmm. related to human beings. Yeah. And what they might have gone through in the last moments before fleeing their homes. That's yeah. all that, that happened with me. Um, I don't, I'm, and our colleagues here, they were published fairly widely. I was never published. Um, so you. they should actually take this, um, this question. Yes. Okay. Well, maybe maybe I'll just give it. No, no, no. Let let me move on because time is running out. Uh, John, yeah. a question for you. Can you, and if so, how can you make the images specific to the unique issues at stake, the unique conditions and the story and the the movement beyond the visual tropes of protest? This is a question from Asmara. Ooh, hi, hi, uh, question for you, John. So so. <laughs> Answer, my answer to that depends on how we approach the question, right? So if we're talking about aesthetically, that's always going to be the, that, that's a very strange alchemy that is specific to each photographer. It, that has to do with their aesthetic taste, that has to do with their training, their experience, their influences. So if we're, if we just take the very simple aesthetic uniqueness of an image and we kind of put that to the side and mm. say that every photographer has their own eye then you know I can't really speak to that because then that would be speaking more about myself in the process and I think what really this question is asking is how do you make images that tell that are faithful to yeah. the story that's how I'm and, reading the question yeah right uh, I think I think the answer is in the question itself right mm. it's my mentor always she has said it to me many times. It's when in doubt, fidelity to the story, right? The story is there for you. The story is there for you to tell. It's in front of you mm -hmm. if you're willing to see it. So when you approach any of the, these stories or just about any story, really, I think this is a universal concept. But if you, if you, if you enter into the story with your eyes wide open and you're willing to hear the people and see the people through your camera um, as they are, and you don't project your own thought process or feelings onto them, but you try to allow them to, to um, develop and unfold in front of you, your mm -hmm. stories will always be unique to and that. authentic, yes. The, you run into trouble when you go into a story and you try to apply a template. Ah, there you go. And, you, you you go into a story and say, oh, well, this is a protest. I've done protests all over the world. I've done them on four or five different con continents, you know, and you just go into it with this mentality of, oh, I know how this works. I know how this is supposed to look. I know yeah. what what wins awards. I know what's going to get me on a panel. Like when you if you approach it that way, then you're just you're just applying a narrative onto something that's already unique and beautiful. But if you if you go and beautiful in a very kind of like capital B beautiful romantic kind of sense. But mm -hmm. if you approach a story and you let the story be as it is and you let the story guide your images and guide your own interpretations, yeah. then you can't help but have unique images. Exactly, exactly. Let me see if I can take one more uh, a question to all of you. Let me try start with Ernesto. Uh, this is from Aldona. Uh, as Ernesto said, the objectivity is not really, doesn't really exist. 
should the photojournalists portraying the protest share their point of view uh, so the audience could know where they are coming from? It's, it's actually the, the question that we, we had earlier about uh, um, being neutral doesn't really exist in, 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 in our type of work and uh, being part of, of the riots got you the shots that, uh, that you got, right, Ernesto? Sorry, uh, you, you caught the last part? Being part of the protest got you the shots that you got in the end. So, yeah, yeah this is, I, I suppose this is a question about being objective or subjective. I think we covered that. There is no such thing as true objectivity, is there? No, but there is a responsibility, no? In these times where, when everybody can take an image, like everybody can take images, is like we, you have to, 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 to be able to refer to some to somebody like media uh, that is going to be a, a true existence of the news in, in, a, in a general sense, no? Like, because, like, like I said, everybody can take an image and there is so many fake news. So mm -hmm. there has to be a, a point in which you can rely, no? So that's something really important for us to do for yeah. them. Yes. I think there's time for one more. Uh, let's see. Sometimes a photographer is in danger from both sides, like Anasta was saying, the government and the protesters. The government doesn't let you take these photos and the protesters, well, we've covered this one, let me move on to another one. Uh, what is your opinion on the recently passed law in France that will make it an offense to share images that identify police officers in operation by face or by name? This is an interesting one. Who, who wants to take it? Just raise your hand. John. Yeah, yeah we, we're all nominating John. We know. Yeah, we know. <laughs> um, I, I mean, we've run, we've, we've run into this periodically. This is not a, a new, uh, thank you for your question. That's, I'm not saying that this is like a pedestrian question. I'm not saying that at all. Mm. The issue of um, what, elements of a story you are responsible for, how those images are used, and the, um, the, the aftermath of making an image. An image is not, doesn't just exist in stasis even though it's a frozen moment. The, the image continues to affect the world that it exists in. So the, the question, a law like that is really about how does in this new world order that we live in, where United, uh, not the United States, the world is united by social media, how do these images per, um, present like a very unique new threat, <clears throat> right? Yeah. Images threatening um, because they have outsized effects after the, after the fact. But this has always existed, right? You could always use, because a photograph is visual evidence of the world in that moment. Yeah. So the question is, are journalists providing evidence? Is this a, um, is this a forensic exercise? telling the story as it is in front of you in the world, uh, you can use it that way in the same way that you can take the philosophy of, you can take the, the works of philosophers throughout history and you can bend it and you can distort it and you can try to use it towards nefarious ends. Mm -hmm. I personally don't feel like it is a service to the world to approach journalism as a threat when journalism is necessary to our continued survival. The dissemination of information is, is important. The question is, do we have a populace that is willing to look at that information and take a moment to consider it rather than just consume it? If we have a world full of people who are simply consuming images, and they're not taking into account why they were made, how they were made, what their purposes are, then it's very easy to manipulate people. And it's very I'm easy afraid. to use an image against the authorities or yeah. the protesters. But right? I'm afraid that that's part and parcel of, of, of social media, the, the, the consumption end of it. It's, it uh, th that, that is one thing that, that, that troubles me, and I'm sure it troubles uh, all of you as well. Uh, this is something Let we need say... to do. Yes, Anastasia. I want to say something about this question. Last year, quickly, uh, there was a pro uh, many protests also in the agricultural uh, co parts of the country, no, because mm. of a uh, low situation. And there was a moment when the people were saying that the police were attacking with fire guns, you know, and the government was saying that that was not true. So there mm. was one guy in the north of Peru that shoot a picture of a police officer 
with his gun like that. And in that image, you can see the face of the police. You can see the gun and you can see the, the, the casket, you call it, I think, no? going out of the gun. Mm -hmm. And that image was the one that opens the whole, like they could never say that they were not using it anymore. And right. that was an evidence. And that evidence made that photographer being threat by the police. No, so that's I think the the moment when you can say that the freedom of press is being threatened by exactly. that. No, I I think that police officers should be covered in specific situations, being specific operations. Maybe that can be true. No, that maybe is is, is something useful. But in something socially talking about, like why why that is against freedom of press no exactly if the police have nothing uh you know what, what's the word i'm trying to find if, if they don't have a bad conscience about something they're doing they shouldn't exactly. be bothered whether or not yeah. uh, okay. or threatened so, also no well threatened yeah. that too that too yes um guys time just flew by really i, I wish we could have another hour to talk but we don't and I, i'm sure that ernesto and john really need to get some shut eye while zishan and i go about life because it's that it's a better time of day for us but I, I really really once again would like to to you know from all of us globally thank you warmly for the work that you do and and thank you personally for being my guests here today john minchillo in the states uh, zishan latif in india and ernesto benavides in peru us. Stay safe, guys. Stay safe and keep feeding us with your wonderful work. Yeah, oh, thank, you. thank you so much. Nice nice thank you. Bless, bless, bless. Okay. So, for the people watching, I'd like to add that the exhibition People Power will be traveling soon to a place near you. I'm just going to name a few Paris in France, uh, Yangon in Myanmar, Strasbourg also in France, Lyon in France. France is really big on World Press Photo. Uh, Lima in Peru, uh, Beirut in Lebanon, this is where the uh, exposition will be traveling towards and who knows what might be added to this list at a later time. Uh, let me also remind you that there are two more sessions before this wonderful World Press Photo 2021 festival closes. Uh, winner presentations, which will start just about now, and the industry talks, which will be starting at 4 o'clock Central European time. Do the math to know what time it is in your part of the world. 4 o'clock CET. So that's the two uh, more events uh, lined up for this afternoon. And uh, that will be uh, before the, the festival closes. So um, what rests for me to say is to thank you. Thank to thank all the partners for making this possible and a special mention for new supporters, Pictorite Funds, thank you for coming aboard at the very last moment. And uh, thank you all for watching and for participating. Sorry I didn't get to all the questions, but you know how it goes. Um, keep abreast of things uh, by just checking out the website, worldpressphoto.org. And for me, it's been a great honor and a pleasure to be a part of World Press Photo 2021. But as you know, all good things come to an end, and the end is now here for me. So from Amsterdam, from me, it's goodbye.